All right. So the Scudders, of course, you know, we call them, we claim them as our yeah. missionaries. Amen. Brett and Bobby met in our church. Yes, sir. So then they got engaged in our church and then got married in our church. And then we kicked them out That's right. of our church <laughs> and sent them to the mission field. So to uh, have really coming up on 11 years, though they are celebrating the 10-year, which is a milestone, uh, they testify that being in Uganda now going on 11 years, they have now seen hundreds of missionaries come and go, which ought to terrify you as far as what you think you're called to do. Now, some of those I'm sure have gone because it was their time to return, but Pastor Brett, what percentage do you think were just failing and washing out? I'd say probably, probably 50% or more were just washed out. 50% or more of, we'll just say, 100 missionary families yeah. were just floundering just, and yeah. failing. Just came to do a thing. Came to do a thing. So I, I only bring that up to testify that they've now been there 11 years. They're getting to be the old missionaries in Kampala. <laughs> the Catanellas, who are our friends, who they served when they first went, they've been there almost 20 years now. Uh, yeah, yeah the 17. 17, 17 in Africa. Yeah. So they're kind of the old timers, and they're our age as well, or thereabout. But one of the things I want to testify to you guys of is, so COVID hit, and we weren't able to go until 22. So I think the last time I was there was 2019 or 2018, pre-COVID. And I was there three times one year <clears throat> doing SMTI, and then I couldn't go for a year or two, then COVID, so then 22, so I was there back in the fall. But what I want to testify of, because Jesus said that you shall go forth, bear fruit, and your fruit will remain, that to go and visit some of the churches that I had been in, we'll say five years prior, you could physically and spiritually feel and see a difference. And I know it's because of their ministry. Now, it's the Lord working through them, so cut me some slack here. But when you have 50% of 100 or 200 missionaries washing out because they're floundering and failing, we can brag on some missionaries for sticking to it and having some consistency. So that's the first church we went to. We had the little one or two day, and I told you they had paved, they had cobbled everything in the backyard. Um, Is that Pastor Kato's church? Kato's church. Mm -hmm. Pastor Kato's church. I preached there once, and you could tell the strength of the church had come up, the yeah. organization, the infrastructure, the governments and administrations. It was a totally different church, and I hadn't been there in five years. And I felt like you can feel Pastor Brett's ministry here. You can feel SMTI's work here and just the repeated work of true missionaries. The proof of the pudding is in the eating, and you can tell if someone's called or not by the fruit of their lives. So I, I don't want us to just be overly familiar with Pastor Brett when he comes. So he's, he's our family. He comes home. We've watched Emma and Ethan grow up. But I want you to know you're, what we're about to hear Turn off the sin of familiarity and realize this is a missionary who has gone in and pioneered works in Uganda, all over the country, at least the southern half, and has fruit that abides and remains. And so with that said, Pastor Brett, come up, have your liberty, liberty preach to us, rebuke, yes, cast out, Amen. call people out, Amen. do your thing. You, Love you. Love you so much. Amen. Thank yes, you. sir. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It's good to see all of you. You know, I, I love the anointing, and I, I, uh, I covet it because uh, what we have here at Engrafted Word, you, you can be so familiar with it that you don't realize how really, really awesome it is. And just even prayer time, worship time, um, you know, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a presence, there's an anointing. And so for my gift and, and the call, the, the commission on my life, it's better to start at a higher point. I think it's always better to start at a higher point uh, than to have to drag it up from the bottom. Some of the challenges that we have in a lot of churches, they don't know how to produce that anointing or how to uh, worship the Lord so that we start on a higher plane. So I'm usually starting at zero, and that takes a while. And, uh, and especially if somebody's clipping their nails or doing something like that, it takes it a little bit longer. I know that's never happened up in here, but, uh, you know, <laughs> don't be clipping your nails in the house of God. Amen. <laughs> or biting them. Yeah. This, this probably never happens either. That never happens. <laughs> oh, right here. 
There we go. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's good stuff. <laughs> Amen. So, uh, but no, I, you know, it, it is a wonderful thing and it, uh, to have the, the anointing as we have it here today. And, and it's constantly like that. And I, I want to I emphasize that point to us. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, please, to the book of James. Amen. Hallelujah. James chapter 4. It's, it's actually Jacob or Jacobo in Luganda. James is the word Jacob. Uh, James chapter 4, you know, there, there's, there is an element, uh, especially coming back this, this time, I, there, there's, there's, there's a heavier element of religiosity that I feel in the United States and especially in the churches uh, that we have. I'm, I don't mean all the churches, but there's that, that tendency, there's that religious uh, spirit that, that wants to get on us through our consistency. Um, but one of the challenges that we have is that we have to be consistent yeah. in our Christianity, and yet consistency can also be the breeding grounds for religiosity. Right. Right. And so there is that element of constant self-evaluation, constant uh, examination of oneself. In fact, the title of my sermon tonight is, What is Your Life? Question mark. Subtitle. Subtitle is evaluating your yieldedness to God. So let's look at this James chapter 4. Are you there? All right. To Gende. That means let's go in Luganda. Notice what he says here in verse 13. Go to now, you that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Verse 14, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. I think as, as missionaries, we have, a, we have a unique perspective on the kingdom of God because we're never in one place all the time. We're, we're, we're constantly on the move. In fact, I've had to learn how to pray, God, thank you for making me uncomfortable and giving me an uncomfortable life a life of constant moving. It's just, it's just our assignment. I miss the consistency of a local church. I miss just coming in, knowing we're going to have like meat, potatoes, cornbread, you know, the fried cornbread, not just the, you know, in the oil and, uh, you know, some collard greens on the side. We're going to have a nice dessert. You know, I, I, it'd, be, it'd be great to have that all the time. But, but there, there is that element of realizing I can't, I can't necessarily depend on that all the time as a missionary. It's me going out. It's me preaching. And, and there are times we, we do the best that we can, but not everyone uh, is, is as receptive as you all are. Not everyone receives the gift on our life like, that, that everyone else might. Amen. And, and, and so we're limited. I, 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 I can understand how in, in cities, uh, many people didn't receive Jesus. I'm sure they didn't receive Paul's ministry because they recognized that or they thought they're only a human. And it's the and instead of opening their eyes to see the gifting that God's placed on. them. Amen. But 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 we see here, James is asking his disciples a very serious question. And I think a lot of times we blow through it instead of letting that settle on us for a moment. He asks the question, for what is your life? Now, he immediately answers it, but I, I want to hover on that, that question for a moment. What is your life? Uh, it, it, it's an existential question. We, we've all thought about it, right? We've all sat there and dreamed about our own life. Maybe in modern vernacular, we would say, you know, what is it that we want to do in life? What do we want to leave behind? What's our legacy? 
But see, legacy doesn't, we don't, we don't start producing it some years down the road. We're producing legacy by what we do today. And what is that legacy? It's not, I, I can't decide it for you. And, and, and you can't decide it for me. I, I was, uh, Ethan turned 15, you know, a few years ago. I think it was 2021, wasn't it, son, that I gave you my ring. It's 21, because you would have been, yeah. He was 15. Oh, you were just turning six. No, you were 15, because you're 17, about to be 18 in seven days? Seven days. All right, next week's Ethan's birthday. He turns 18, right? Uh, and I was sitting down with him, and I had my, my ring from when I was 16 years old. And I remember at 16, I, this, this ring's kind of cheap, okay? It's, it's not like, you know, it's going to be in the Smithsonian or anything. This thing's kind of a cheapie. And I had my, you know, the S carved on the, you, know, you remember signet rings when they were all the? Okay, Pastor Chris remembers, a few others. You never had one. You were too cool for that. Yeah, yours would have been like, you know, a rope or something, a hippie, hippie ring. <laughs> so I had, I was all proud, but you know, that was the day, that was the, that was the thing. And I remember, I remember sitting there saying, one day I'm going to give this to my son. Okay, and that's a simple thing, right? It's, it's nothing, it's, but my heart at 16 years old longed to do something for my children in, in the next generation to impact them beyond what I had. No one gave me a ring, right? And, and, uh, and I'm not, I'm, I don't want you to go out and buy a ring, right? I don't want you to go out and move to Uganda unless you're called there and we need help. So some of y'all better get ready. But anyway, <laughs> seriously, we do need some help. <laughs> but that concept was important to me at that time. And I realized what I'm doing today is setting the stage for my family's generation. So I gave him that ring and I had tears in my eyes and I said, son, I don't give you a great heritage, unfortunately. My dad was an alcoholic. He was a womanizer. Left me, left our family when he was one, when I was one. And bounced in and out of our life. Thank God, eventually we had a relationship. But I had no real heritage from there. There's a cool story I'll tell you in just a moment from that. But then, you know, mom, you know, she's trying to be a good mom. She's single mom, two kids. She marries this guy. He's the wrong guy. Marries this guy. He's the wrong guy. Finally ended up with our stepdad who shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with us and taught us, uh, uh, put us in Pentecostal circles and in Pentecostal training. Thank God for that. Amen. But he never gave me a ring. Now, I love him. I honor him. But there's something beyond just being there. There's something beyond just going through the motions, right? I, I think I shared this with us a few years ago, but the Lord dealt with me. I was driving down uh, the Gaba Road, which is the, one of the main outlets of, of town. And I'm, I'm just praying. I'm praying for people. I'm just meditating on, on the word. And I heard the Spirit of God say, there's a faithfulness within faithfulness that you've not yet found. There's faithfulness within faithfulness that you've not yet grabbed hold of. See, we can be doing what we're supposed to be doing, but that doesn't mean we're in the next level faithfulness. You're not, you, you can go through the motions, but you maybe not, haven't yet tapped into the fullness of what God expects for you, got what God plans for you. That's where we ask the question, what is your life. It's, it's, it's taking ourselves uh, out of ourselves for a minute and examining what is it that we are doing? What is it that we're producing? What's the, what, what's the aroma of my life as Pastor Chris teaches us all the time? What, what are those things that we're putting off and, and, and emanating from our life that compels somebody to do something for Jesus? Or are we even putting off anything he says here, he says, your life is a vapor. Uh, uh, the, in the Jameson Fawcett Brown, uh, I, I like looking at this commentary. He says, what is your life? It's like a shimmering, evanescent bubble. 
Think about it. Y'all know what I'm talking about because you've blown bubbles before and the bubble lands on something and it shimmers. It's got a, you, you know, it's got the rainbow color to it that kind of moves around and then it's gone. It shimmers. It's an evanescent bubble and it's gone. So what's the point of this, this passage? The point of this passage is that your life does not belong to you. It, you and I, 80 years is nothing in, in, in history. 85 years, 90 years, whatever the Lord allows us to have, it's really nothing on the grand scheme of history. You know, I, I don't know if you've ever done this. I'm going to get back to my ring in just a minute. But I don't know if you've ever done this. Just consider, like try to put yourselves in the shoes maybe of some of the, the, the church fathers that we had. And I think that, that, that Brother Mark taught on Augustine and, uh, you know, all, all of these guys, all, you know, all, Polycarp, all of these guys that lived and died for one thing, to, 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 pre to preach the gospel, to dig deeply into the, the manna of the word of God and study out the mysteries of God. Their, that, their entire life was consumed in that. Now, not everybody can do that. Not everybody can be a pastor full time. Not everybody can be a missionary full time. But at the, at the same time, I think we all ought to examine ourselves and look at what, what is, what's the next level faithfulness that we need to dig into. Because our life is literally a vapor. It's here for a moment and then we're done. And so... You know, we, we, we know how to pace ourselves. There's, there's the understanding of pacing yourself, learning to rest. All of those are truths, but at the same time, are we burning as hot as we can until Jesus comes back? That's the testimony. That's the legacy that we want. So I told Ethan, I said, son, I don't, I don't give you, you know, hundreds of years of, of preachers or hundreds, hundreds of years of, of, you know, great people because I don't have that necessarily. But what I give you, it, it starts with me. Right. Starts with this woman right here Amen. that I married. Amen. We have started a new legacy in my family. Yes, I went back. We, 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 we actually met some of my dad's family, my, my natural father's family. We, we dug back. My birth grandfather, can I say it that way? My natural grandfather. My dad was adopted. We'll get there in a moment. Just hold on. It's a really good story, I promise. <laughs> my natural grandfather, his last name was Brown. He was convicted of armed robbery, had his leg shot off <laughs> as he tried to escape on the chain gang and ended, up, ended his days in a wheelchair, a drunken, in a stupor, alcoholic stupor. That's how he died. And... My aunts and uncles on, on that side of the family, you know, they were trying to take care of him. But, uh, you know, the one that was caring for him, she called all the other siblings, hey, you know, dad's died. <laughs> and everyone said, cool, we're done with that. No legacy. My dad was adopted by the Scudder family. Horrible man, beat my dad, mistreated him and abused him. No legacy. He, he, what belonged to my father uh, through, through adoption, what should have belonged to him, he was stolen from him. We should have farms in Michigan. Like There were a lot of farms we should technically have. No legacy. That, that somehow got broken. So I told Ethan, I said, son, I don't have this magnificent legacy for you. I, I want to encourage you that there, it's not all about you know, who your mama, your daddy, and your granny is. Yeah. We can change all that. The grace of God can change all that. The, the mercy of God can change all that. Amen. And so uh, I told him, I said, son, I don't have much, but what I've got, it's now yours. Don't mess it up. And all the dads said, amen. <laughs> and I said, so son, this ring's yours. He said, dad. Can you keep it somewhere for me so I don't lose it? <laughs> I'll do it. It's still yours, man. We got you. Amen. He knows he maybe prone to, you know, we move around so much. Praise God. 
But I think it's a good, I think it's a, it's, it's a good exercise for us to go through the process of asking this question, what is your life? What, what, what's, what's, the, what's the evanescence of your own life? What is it that you're striving for? I, I wrote down a lot of things. I, I, I had so many things just bubbling in my brain, I had to write them down. The compulsions of the Christian life require us to continuously evaluate our service to Jesus Christ. We must constantly evaluate the actions and activities of our, life, of our lives to determine if they align and are in line with the will and purposes of God for our lives. Constantly. I do this all the time as a missionary. Lord, am I still in the right place? Are you still happy with me? Are, are you still okay with me? Did I do something stupid? Did I mess something up? Did I, did I hurt someone? Uh, did, did I say something at a church I shouldn't have? Did I overstep my authority? Th those are things I have to watch. Because I can, you know, it's easy to come in as the big guy. And I have to constantly humble myself and be sure that I'm not coming out as something I shouldn't. This begins with evaluating heart motives and intentions. We might even begin by asking the question, what do I intend to do today? That seems simple, but we, we ask, does that intention fulfill our Christian mandate to serve Jesus Christ with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength? You, you, you may have an eight to five, and that's awesome, and I thank God for it because eight to fives are what, we need those. We need that routine. We need that, that, that constant income. But what's the intention of your life in doing that? What are, what are you seeking to accomplish what is my life? It's the existential question that mankind has been asking for centuries and millennia. It precipitates itself in modern day analogies by asking what will they write on my tombstone? Again, what is my legacy? What's the heritage that I leave to my children, grandchildren, and subsequent generations? Now here's a really cool story. My dad was adopted. I'm, my last name was supposed to be Brown. Bobby Brown. Bobby Brown. <laughs> she just said it's her prerogative. She can do what she wants to do. <laughs> and Bobby Brown. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> my dad's family, he was adopted into... Uh, a family, his dad was named Wade Scudder. Had no children of his own, so he adopted two boys, my dad and my uncle. So he was the last of the Scudders. Literally, the last of the Scudder family in that vein. Now, dad was adopted. He should have received the entire inheritance. He and his brother should have received the inheritance from his, that family. But there was some wrangling that went on and a married uh, wife, he, the, their mother, the adopted mother, passed of cancer. Dad remarried, Wade Scudder remarried, and then all those children just subverted my, brother, my, my dad and his brother and, and took the inheritance out from underneath him. But there's a cool thread here. Scudders have been missionaries for, hundreds, uh, for 100 years. We've been missionaries in India and Sri Lanka for a hundred years. They were some of the most brilliant doctors. And they went to Sri Lanka in Ceylon, which is the north part. It's super hot, super muggy. I, I, that would have been cool. I wish I would have brought a picture of that. Uh, but they set up uh, an infirmary in Ceylon. And uh, they began to train other doctors. They began to train doctors and nurses. They, become, they became the premier a uh, uh, healthcare training facility in all of Sri Lanka. And then they began their work in, in, in inner India and began working there. So God has kind of a way of saying, uh, you know, you thought you didn't have a legacy, but guess what I did for you? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Because I had zero inclination. I didn't know any of that before we became. In fact, it was the kids, it was Ethan's headmaster at the school, at Heritage International School that told me he's, Sri Lankan. He said, do you know your history? <laughs> uh, kinda, not really. I was a, my dad was adopted. 
and he explored it for me. It's really awesome. Very cool. There is a, there's a house, whenever we get property, I'm going to replicate it. There is a house today that says the Scudder House in Ceylon, in, in, in northern Sri Lanka. So we're going to replicate that when we get property sometime soon, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. So today, it's, ne- it's, it's ever the more important for us to continue to, ask, to continue to ask the question, what's my life? What is it that I'm striving to accomplish? What do I want to look back and see at the end of my life? Am I proud of my accomplishments? Now, I'm not trying to make this, a, you know, some of these things we talk about at funerals and whatnot, because it's a, it's a moment to do that. But I think it's important. Am I proud of my accomplishments? Am I proud of what I've produced as a father, as a husband, what I've produced in my wife, what we've produced together? Am I proud of that? Amen. Uh, Thinking about Ethan's life and graduation in the recent days, I've been compelled to examine myself and my own input into his training and preparation for life. His success or failure will be a reflection of mine and his mother's investments into his life. Knowing that he's prepared for the day ahead brings me great comfort, even though I know he will be tempted, tested, tried, and even persecuted based on my teachings and my example to follow Jesus in his life. He's in for it. Amen. But in a good way. Amen. it's, it's his responsibility to carry the legacy, to take the mantle, to move forward, to, to take this life that he's been given and grow from it. Now, I could say the same about Emma. It's just recent history is Ethan. So, Emma, you're doing great. And we're proud of you. And I love you, baby doll. <laughs> Mama going to get you a ring sometime. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what she's waiting on. But uh, actually, she has a ring waiting on her. Yeah, it's a really nice ring, isn't it? It's grandma's ring. It's, it's real nice, Clark. <laughs> but see, along the way then, we come to course corrections. And I, I know I'm just talking, but we're going to get into some Bible study here. There are course corrections. And, and when we see something is off, are we actually changing course or are we just kind of leaning into it for a bit and then bouncing off whenever the, the trouble, the challenge has passed? The measure of a man's life is in the people that he impacts. I'm not trying to wax philosophical, but I hear the Spirit of the Lord telling us these things. The measure of a man's life is in the people that he impacts. Who are we looking to impact? Not just what are we doing necessarily, who are we impacting? Who are we investing in? Are we investing in? Are we doing anything for anybody else? What is the difference we're looking to make in those around us? That might be the truest test of our yieldedness to God because the greatest assignment from heaven is and always will be to make disciples of all nations. That doesn't necessarily look like a building. One of the challenges I have as a missionary, I want to show all these like big buildings and all these other things. And I don't necessarily have that at this point. Amen. God's going to do some things and we're, we're looking forward to that. Hallelujah. But I don't have a physical investment that I can point to at this moment. But I've got a lot of people I can point to. I've got thousands of pastors I can point to you and say, see him, see her, see them. That's the measure that I have. And it's not a physical, it's not a tangible. I can't tell you they have increased in spirituality by 50%. I don't have a metric like that, right? That's what we want in engineering circles. That's what corporations want to see. What's what's the measure? We, We don't have a natural measure in the work that we do. It's a supernatural one. It's it's being out five years and coming back saying, Yeah, God's doing something here. There's some difference. It's it's coming in and and, and feeling faith. That might sound weird, 
but feeling faith in the people, feeling it grow, uh, sensing that they're not just, they're not who they were. We, at, we can continue the discussion by asking, what are the pursuits of my life? What am I after? After years in the workforce, this question can seem to be a rhetorical one. Hear, hear me out. This is important. Considering that someone's been on the same course in the same direction for possibly an extended period of time. The reality should be that the uncertainties of time and situation compel us to trust a living God and walk by faith and not by sight. It is very easy. Pastor Vaughn stood here and pointed by the Spirit of God and said, some of you all make too much money to obey God. And I sat right there where these girls are, and I said, not me in Jesus' name. I don't care how much I make. It is not going to own me. It is not going to direct the course of my life. I'm going to use it for the kingdom of God, but it doesn't direct me. But a lot of people, their mindset is that way because they're only looking at one level of faithfulness. And they're not switching into that next gear that God wants us to be at. We should not trust in our chosen profession or career path, but rather in the provision and sustenance of an almighty God who refuses to fail, who refuses to give up, and refuses to allow us to fail to complete our assignment. God wants you to win more than you want to win. We need to tap into that aspect of God's help. He wants you to overcome more than you want to overcome. He doesn't want you where you are. And he's just waiting for the opportunity to help you. But see, all this takes a surrendering to God. It takes a fresh surrendering. The, the, the rote, the routine, the mundane must be replaced with the expectant, excited, faith-filled pursuit of God. Even in the midst of consistently doing what we know to do. To him who knows what to do and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. It's like, it's like driving in first gear. I don't know. We had this broke down car that we used to have, didn't we, babe? Come on, kids. Can I get a hallelujah? Amen. The Subaru, it would not shift out of first gear unless it wanted to. I don't, have you ever driven a car like that? Okay. Brother Robert had. That's because you had your big Rock and roll drums and your guitars in the back seat. What? <laughs> Studebaker. Oh, come on. Right on. White wall tires. <laughs> no, couldn't, couldn't afford them. <laughs> this, the car would just, it would just wind out. We're moving. I mean, we're tacked out. 7,000 RPM. <laughs> Something's about to go. Either the, the engine's going to go or the, it's gonna, the transmission's going to shift. But something's going to happen. And by the grace of God, if it happened to shift, the kids would go, yeah! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Didn't you guys? Like, we were like, we did it. We can go somewhere today. It's awesome. <laughs> Amen. But see, you were moving, but you're not engaging in next level faithfulness. You can go faster, you can go farther, but something has to change. It takes you letting go of something. It takes you letting go of a, of a dream. It takes you letting go of a vision, a notion. As pastors told us many times, Cookville's got a dream for you. They know how to pigeonhole you pretty good. Yeah. They get you looking at this, you know, the sparkly this, the fancy that, and it pigeonholes you into a dream that you didn't, you didn't, you really don't even want it. Unless maybe you do, I don't know, but I remember Bobby, <laughs> Bobby was spending some time with some girlfriends of hers and her girlfriends are, you know, I think it was, I was at Christmas time or something like that. And somebody was saying, oh, there's a tree ornament. I have to have it. <laughs> and Bobby's like fresh off the mission field. You got to have an ornament. That's like what you got to have. Honestly. It's what you have to have. 
Hello? Yeah. See, see what the world's done to us. And through our repu- repetition, we've become religious, religious instead of being more fervent for Christ. Yeah. Amen. I, think about Paul. Paul kept going to those places that yeah. beat him. Yeah. Sure. That's not fun. No. Yeah. It's not exciting. I don't think he was... Yay. But what did he say here? Turn with me to Romans chapter 14. Let's get the words of Paul out in front of us. Romans chapter 14. Notice what he says here in verse 7. Actually, let's back up a little bit. Let's read verse 5. One man esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded or that is fully assured in his own mind. He that regards the day regards it to the Lord. And he that regards not the day to the Lord, he does not regard it. He that eats, eats to the Lord. He that, gives, uh, he that giveth God thanks, Uh, Excuse me, for he giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. Verse 7, for none of us lives to himself, and no man dies to himself. For whether we live, we live to the Lord, and whether we die, we die to the Lord. Paul, Paul he's, he's talking about the consistencies of life of continuing to do what you know to do, but yet pressing on despite the challenges, pressing on beyond the spirit of this world. And he concludes by saying, whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose And revived that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Christ died, gave his life so that you and I would not live the mundane side of consistently doing what we know to do. There's a flip side to it. There's a zeal that that you and I, we, we miss sometimes. And we can let that wane and we can let it fade. And we got to find a way to keep building that back up. And keep stirring the embers so that my eight to five job is not what I live to do. We don't work to live. Or what is it? We don't live to work. We work to live. We work so that we can live. Hello. Amen. I remember I would take walks around. You know, I used to work at Cummins Filtration out there with Brother Bill. And uh, Brother Bill's a legend out there, by the way. Amen. And, and I would just have to clear my mind. I would be, you know, working on a project and I would just walk around the building and I would sit there and say, there is no life in making filters. I just kept saying that over and over like, Lord, how long? It's it, it pays, you know, it pays the bills and I'm not I don't please don't take that any other way. But I was like, Lord, there's more to life. Than, than this work, than projects and timelines and Gantt charts and, you know, engineering studies and fuel filter studies. And, you know, those things are good. We do them. But what's the, what's the purpose behind it? What's the end result of that? The passions behind it are what we're looking at. So he says, whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Now turn with me to the, the book of Luke. Are you guys okay? Yes, sir. Luke chapter 9. This is a passage very familiar. Anyone that was in my youth group heard the Matthew version of this. Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, are you there? All right. Luke 9, 23. Jesus said to them, what's that next word? Hold on a second. He said to who? All. All. Now, we, we know he's speaking to his disciples, but he's, there's, there's got to be more people around. Jesus is not selective on whom he wants to be with him. He wants all of us. 
I, I was, we, Pastor Chris and I, we were in Iowa teaching the youth conference. And, uh, I, you know, as a missionary, I just got to teach the Great Commission. It's just part of us, right? We had that, you remember we had that, that run for missions and we had go ye and, you know, like it's just, that's just, it's just stuck with me. Even our, the evangelism manual that I wrote way back, I don't know if you remember that, Pastor, a long time ago. Yeah, it was, it was about 20 years ago. It was go ye. That was just was the word. So everyone picked on us and was like, go ye. Go ye. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, the, com the, the, the Great Commission doesn't say go and then at some point in time you can stop. Right. It's the present participle version of the word go. It means go and keep on going. And it's, it's indiscriminate. And in, in other words, everyone is involved. That Great Commission is pointed at you just as much as it's pointed at me or your pastor. Hello. Yeah. Just trying to. Get you ready for the return of Christ. Is that all right? Amen. We want to be ready. Amen. Amen. All right. So Jesus said, if any man come after me, it's a big if. Because Christ doesn't make us do anything we don't want to do. He's a gentleman. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross. What's that next word? Daily. Daily and... Follow me. Verse 24. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. And that's, that's the world we live in. We're, we have a lot of people doing everything they can to have this XYZ life. And they've dreamed it up or, you know, they've read all the, all the, 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 the you know, financial reports. You got to do this so that you can do that. You got to save up this much money so that you can do that. And I, I love that. We all need to do it. Right. Dave Ramsey says today, live like no one else so that later on you can live like no one else. Right. It's good wisdom. Did I tell you, Dave Ramsey taught me how to water ski. Did I tell you guys that I stayed in his house? Yep. He but <laughs> well, I've been meaning to call him about that. Amen. Yeah, I he bought pizza for me. It was cool. We watched water skiing videos. Amen. We 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 have those natural understandings, but that doesn't map out the course of our life. That, that doesn't dictate the mandates of our daily life. Jesus said, whoever will lose his, uh, excuse me, save his life shall lose it. And I'm painting a picture here because we're going we're gonna to look at another verse in just a moment and see how this flips around. See, whosoever shall save his life actually ends up losing it. Why? Because you don't take up your cross daily. You don't take that mandate every day and take that cross and say, my life is not my own. I've been bought with a price. Instead, many people wake up and say, what am I going to do today? Yeah. I'm going to buy and sell and get gain. That's what I'm going to do. Yep. Instead of saying, Lord, if you will, what do you want me to do today? Can I challenge you something in a little somewhere? Uncle Bretty. <laughs> Amen. When you go to prayer, ask God what he wants you to pray about. That'll help your prayer time. That'll help your depth of prayer because you'll stop thinking about yourself. And you'll ask him what he wants. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. But Jesus says that there's, there's three requirements of following Christ. You guys know this. I, I'm sure I've said it here before. Deny yourself. Pastor said this. Deny yourself. That means you don't, you don't get a say and what happens, take up your cross daily. That means the flesh has to die and you have to bear in your body the marks of Jesus Christ and follow. None of those things are put you out front. Not, none of those things put you out front. All of those put him out front. We do what he has called us to do. Now, your assignment may be an eight to five to generate income so that you can take care of your family. That's a massive assignment. 
but it's also to fund the kingdom. And many of you all do that very, very well. But the passions behind it, we have to renew them. We have to restore that so that it's not the mundane, it's not religious. It's not a defeated version. For what, he says, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be a castaway? Now turn with me to uh, let's turn turn with me to John chapter eleven real quick. I promise I only have about another forty five minutes or an hour to go. We're 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 doing good. All right, you're you're hanging tough like the like the back uh, not Backstreet Boys kid new kids on the block hanging tough. John chapter eleven verse twenty five. Now, this, this came to me as I, I was meditating on this. Actually, I was leaving the house, and I said, I got to put that verse in there because it does it so well. Now, we know the story, story of Lazarus. Jesus, he's coming to the, the, the grave of Lazarus. He, he's coming to Bethany. Um, here, Martha runs to him, and she's, oh, Jesus, and she's falling at his feet, and and Jesus is trying to reassure her, your brother will live again. And she says, I know he will live again in the resurrection. But Jesus makes something very clear to her. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. Pause for just a moment. What's going on with Lazarus right now? He did. He's not breathing. But Jesus doesn't say, I will raise him from the dead. That's not what Jesus said. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. It's not just enough to get him alive, living in a body. He's got to be alive to fulfill the assignment that God has on his life. He's got to be alive and then given life. Hallelujah. It's going to knock your socks off what this tells us here in just a moment. So notice he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Everyone said, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Do you believe in Jesus today? Amen. Amen. Of course you do. You're in the house of God. Now, I did a small word study. I love Greek word studies. I'm, I'm, I'm doing them more and more. The word life has multiple meanings. In James chapter 4, verse 14, the word zoe, James 4, 14, what is your life? You remember that early on? It, it literally means the state of one possessed with vitality or animation or animate, a living soul, and it is spoken of living an earthly life. So James's question, what is your life? He's asking you, are you alive? Your life of itself, this, this life, when we look at each other and there, we say you're alive, right? We don't see your soul, but we see your outer shell. That's this life that he's talking about. You're at least living. You're not dead. It's profound, isn't it? Right? He says, what is your life? It is but a vapor. But the, when Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life, Jesus, that, that word life is the word zoe, and it means life real and genuine. Now, there was, there, there's, a, there's a, a, a late, well, it was a first century B.C. philosopher in Rome named Cicero that had a Latin, there was a Latin expression. And the Latin expression is vita que sola vita nominanda. I'll say it again just so you can hear me say some Latin words. <laughs> V-I-T-A. Vita or vita, which would be life. Vita que, 
sola vita nominanda. And what it means is a life that can only be called life. A life that can only be called life. In other words, Without the Zoe renewed God kind of life in your life, you're not actually alive. You were once dead in your trespasses and sins. You lived, but you weren't really living. You were alive, but you weren't really alive. Hello? So what can happen to us as Christians, if we're not living in that Zoe life, we're going to fall back in line just with the rest of the world. And we're going through the motions just like they're going through them. And you might have called on the name of Jesus, but something's missing. There's a lot of Christians. I, I mean, I, I used to hear preachers say this all the time, pastor. There's a lot of Christians. I, I wonder if they're really Christians. I wonder if they're really born again. Because some, that, that life within us should do something to us. It should, it should engage this ear. It should engage next level faithfulness in our lives. Amen. It should take us out of just keeping a, a rote routine and it should elevate that to where we do what we do in the name of Jesus Christ. We do what we do for the kingdom of God. Amen. The Jews had that very clear when they, the Lord told them to set the tabernacle first, whenever they would move the tabernacle, y'all remember that story? They would move the tabernacle, the tabernacle would be set up first. And then the Jews had to all encamp around the tabernacle. You guys know that story. So that when they came out of their tent, the first thing they saw was the Shekinah glory of God resting on the temple, on the tabernacle. Their lives were built around the kingdom of God. And that's why Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. A life that can only be called life. The definition of Zoe goes on to say, a life active and vigorous, devoted to God and blessed. I like that. A life that is active and vigorous. Sounds nothing like the, the region Sounds nothing like the, the, the slothfulness of, of life, even though people are busy scurrying doing this and that. Yeah. It's aimless. It's nonsensical because it has no eternal point. Yeah. Your life is an evanescent bubble. Yeah. And it will pop. Yeah. What is the, what's the vapor that remains inside that bubble? What's the legacy that you pass on after this life has popped? Hello? Uh, we, we, we need to challenge ourselves to go beyond that, that mundane rote routine. All of us, we all have bills. We all have things we want to accomplish in life. And that's you know, financially, that's awesome. I think it's very important for people to, to save and do. Bless God, we spent all of our savings. <laughs> we did it for Jesus, though. High five, honey, babe. Amen. No, we have some savings, don't no, It's all right. We're trying. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. But the end of days is the end of days. And, and, and your pastor, you know, our pastor, I'm trying to put this more on you guys, but our pastor teaches us we're in the last days. Dr. Barclay's been saying it for a long time. The word last days in the book Timothy or in, in Timothy's writings, uh, it, it literally means the last days or the, the end of things. It, it means the last port of call on the journey across the sea. We are pulling in to the last port. Carried by the wind of time, we are arriving at the last port of call. There is no other destination beyond the last days. That's literally what that means. So we, we really don't have time. What you waiting on? Now, I'm not saying you're gonna, God's going to move you to some other place. I'm not saying that at all. But what's, what's been in your heart forever 
what's been in your heart, what's been your passion to do for the kingdom of God. I don't mean just your dream. We, we got to lay all those on the altar. You know what I'm saying. But when's, when is the time? When's the time to take your faithfulness and shift it into another gear? And, and be faithful in your faithfulness. Another further definition, and I'm wrapping up, of Zoe life. It's the portion even in this world of those who put their trust in Christ. The portion even in this world of those who put their trust in Christ. Brothers and sisters, we don't put our trust in riches. We know that. But some of us still try to do that. Okay, let's talk about the church across the way, up the hill, over yonder. They try to do that. Hello? It creeps on you, doesn't it? Life is, it has a spirit and life has plans and purposes for you. And you have got to find a way. We all have to find a way to keep that off of us. It is a, it is a matter of constant evaluation. That keeps us on course. It keeps us stirred. It keeps us impassioned. It keeps us on fire for Jesus. And it never stops. Take up thy cross daily. So I'm asking you the question as I close, what is your life? Now again, not everyone can up and move. Not everyone has the call to move. And, and so please don't take that any other way. I'm just telling you, what's God talking to you about? What, what, what's the last thing that, that, that pricked your heart that your pastor talked about? You got a few amens. Can I tell you something as we close? Closing number three, right, babe? Or is that number four? You know, it takes 21 days to break a habit. You know, it takes 21 more days to build a new habit. Do you know it takes 21 more days for that habit to never be broken? So 63 days it takes us to turn some things around permanently. And even then, we got to stay on it. There's that element of you and I breaking away. You try to save your life, you try to hang on to it, you're going to lose it because it'll suck you down. It'll take you to places you don't want to be. And we're all, we're all witnesses of that. We've all done stupid stuff. Say it with me, we've done stupid stuff, right? I've done more stupid stuff than you probably. The Chinese spare rib that I threw and that... <laughs> Lord Jesus... <laughs> but those are those are things that, that we thank God we can move beyond them hallelujah and distance ourselves from that and never go back and do those things again that big guy's laughing were you there you were there <laughs> I love that, that you were there. It's awesome. It's so cringy. Sometimes I, sometimes I catch myself thinking about that, like, oh, Jesus. My face turned red. Y'all have done that. You, you got stupid stuff, makes your face turn red, and you know, you, it's 20 years ago. You're like, thank God we can move beyond that. Amen. And a lot of y'all saw my stupid stuff, so thanks for... Let me move beyond it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but what is our life? What, what are we doing with the day that we have? What are we doing with the time that we have? And I don't, I, I'm telling you, I don't say this as anybody other than your brother. You're in, you're, I'm, I'm one with you. I, 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 we were just standing Sunday night and the Lord spoke that word in my heart. What is your life? And I knew it was for tonight. Because we, we need to stir that, 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 that question up again. What is my life? What is it that, that I've got to do? And, and, and here's, here's the point, closing number 17. There's, you got all the grace that you need. Jesus, Paul 
that was talking about this and, and he was petitioning the Lord for him to break things off of him. And, and the Lord told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. It's, it's already there. Sometimes we, we pick on the Baptist, but they kind of pick up on some of this stuff. There's not always an anointing to move on. You just got to make the determination to move on and let's get it done. Hallelujah. There wasn't, we didn't have a peaceful, easy feeling as we were traveling to Uganda. It wasn't there. Amen. You remember we, sing, we took the eagle song and turned it around to a worship song? I got a peaceful, easy feeling. I know God won't let me down. Did y'all ever sing that? Because I'm already standing on solid ground. Church it up, baby. <laughs> it wasn't a peaceful, easy feeling. We're doing it afraid because we got to answer the call. You are not promised easy in this life. You've never been promised easy. You've just been promised better. You got a new legacy waiting on you. And it starts with us. It starts right here. It starts whenever you start it, praise God. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. I feel like a, I don't know. Making an altar call, I don't know if an altar, that's an altar call won't work. We just need to talk to the Lord for just a minute. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Let, yeah, let's pray in the Spirit. Hale ale ele elia aloso. Woo, la dalo o la 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 le se le. Loboso. Yes, sir. Ha ha, pato la mambra. Hecapra mamboso covra. Salababade. Mangadura. Manda lobovo le kilibe. Libandi bligi de ba. Sekapaf. I want you to continue to pray in tongues, but think about that thing that God's been dealing with you about. Just keep praying in other tongues, but have that in your mind as you as you meditate on what God has got, He's got for you, what the assignment that God's been dealing with you about. As you pray in other tongues, pray that out. Le cabra basoko, kora mambregese, selegibre, manzadede, mancatele, mambria setare. Manga de la gibra ga he loco soco fora man setele acata la man va la bosso le le mimbi vidi ambra e capani mamma si capani mamma si che a mante bandu su come ne che fan me si manti liga ba menga di ba da vedere ba da di pa i pani mi pani chi mamni ste mi standi bavani kama mengla gandoso zipata de paketishi ke pali lingi brown so i curse that i curse that hold off of you in jesus name i curse that fearful hold on your life in jesus name e kapa fara mambra banzora di de bandiste e kapa na mande dise kama nasto i curse that off of you Le pono ko foro mande ziki pana ni mamdosu. A kapana kaste. I curse shame. Kasa konde bevediste. I curse shame. I, I curse regret and resentment. I curse that off of you. Le po foro mamdosu. May it not hinder you anymore. La mede le giba da sodora. Di kapana ni mamdosu. A life that can only be called life. So la man vade gede ba vade de di sodora. La bodo do sodo le ligi di badana de man vadana di kapaniste. Yeah. We've got to cast off any regret. Akana mombo store. We've got to cast off any shame or any embarrassment. Embarrassment will just keep you where you are. You got to cast that junk off of you. It's old and smelly anyway. It's like a cast. 
and you've left it on too long, it's time to cut it off, even if it's going to be a little stinky inside, a little, your bone may not be as strong as you want it to be. But in order for the muscles to grow, you got to cut it off. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Makatede. Mantelika mamboduso. Lede mamboduso. Some of you, you've petted that cast and you've excused yourself. It's been an excuse. It's, there's healing underneath it. You just got to cut that thing off. Stretch forth thy hand in the name of Jesus Christ. Stretch forth your hand in faith. Stretch forth your arm in faith. That thing that you thought was feeble, the thing that you thought to be lame, stretch it forth in the name of Jesus. You'll find a new strength there. You'll find new courage there. There is grace to fix things. Le mambo fura manza de gesto. Never, never, <laughs> Lord Jesus, never say it's too late for me. Never say it's too late for me. If the bubble is not popped, it's not too late for me. It's not too late for me. Say it with me. It's not too late for me. Le kamomo so demanda de sidi. Le badabondo so demanda de sidi. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's not too late for us. Jesus, what the bagasi ki pala mumbo for? Jesus, what the mongosto? Yes, sir. Ah, thank you, Father. Father, I thank you that you've given us this season. It is a day of grace because you haven't yet come. We're, we're, we're not at the port yet. We're, we're approaching the port, the last port of call. But it hasn't. The ship has not docked yet. We're still here. Help us, Heavenly Father, to put off shame, regret. May we hate that. May we just hate the embarrassment. May we hate all that stuff so much that we want to do everything we can to serve you. Lord, light a fire in us. Light our hair on fire. Let our, light our eyes on fire. Father, let, light our hearts on fire. Let everything about us be on fire for you. And we break off the stagnancy that has hindered us from walking in the fullness of your will faithful within faithful. Oh, help us, Heavenly Father. Help, help us, Lord. Lord, these days are dark and they're, Lord, there's darkness all around us. There's gross darkness that covers the earth. But you have said of us, arise, shine, for thy light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. May we rise and shine in the glory of God. Forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth to those things which are ahead. Help us, Heavenly Father, to press toward the mark of the prize of the upward calling, the upward calling, the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. May we forsake everything. May we forsake our nets that we have held to. May we forsake the oxen that we have used for so many years as a source uh, of, of comfort and, and uh, uh, Lord, just, just uh, a source of, uh, of sustenance. And may we cling to you as our sustainer. Father, help my brothers and sisters. Help me, Jesus. Help us in all the ways that we need to trust you more. Help us in all the ways that we need to depend on you more. Because this world is not our home. We are not citizens of this planet. We are citizens of heaven. Father, help us to do it. Let me just ask you just to lift your hands one more time to the Lord and just tell him right now I'm going to do it. 
I'm tired of having excuses. I'm tired of, of having them in front of you. It's been a God and you told me to have no other gods before me. So I'm cutting off the cast. It's going to stink. It might look different. The bone might look different, but I'm going to do it. So help me God. Say it with me. So help me God. Say it again. So help me God. Father, I thank you for the courage and the fortitude and the determination for every one of us to do what we have said we would do. Help us, Lord, to fulfill your commission on our life. May we do it with gusto. May we do it with fire and intensity as these days conclude. We love you, sir. We live for you. You're ours and we are yours to command. We bless you, Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Pastor Chris, hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for this word, this exhortation, this challenge, this teaching. Lord, this is nothing we haven't heard before in a hundred other ways, but we need the reminder. Lord, if you're reminding us again, it means there's still hope, there's still grace, there's still an opportunity to change, to jump start, to jump in the race, to the, the game's not over, there's still an opportunity to pull out a destiny. We thank you, Father, for the challenge, but the encouragement that's in the challenge. You don't correct us to watch us fail. You don't command us to watch us fail. You correct and command to see us produce even better, to enjoy more of your life in our life. We thank you, Lord, for this word tonight. We receive it. May it minister to us. May we wake up thinking about it. We thank you, Lord, for the testimonies of people being changed, challenged, and coming up even higher. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a seat, if you would.